Well, I'll try and make it as short as possible. Um, I graduated from the University of Michigan in 1951. Uh, I had a scholarship from the United States Naval Academy, which paid all my fees and all my costs out there, and in return I was going to become a naval officer for five years. But the very last day I was in Ann Arbor, a gentleman came up to me and he said, uh, you just graduated in civil engineering? I said, yes. He said, I've got a job for you. I said, I wish I could take it, but I'm due to go into the uh, Navy. He said, I can fix that. He said, because I represent a major construction company that is um, uh, working in North Africa, building Air Force bases against the possible spread of Russia, Soviet Union across Europe. So I said, great, because it was a lot warmer in North Africa than Korea, and nobody was going to shoot at me. So I went over there, and when I had leisure time, I liked to travel. Uh, first time I went to Cairo, not to see the sights, but because it was a hot town. <laughs> this was under the British uh, regime there. So I went to Cairo, and of course, did the mandatory Kalash ride to the Great Pyramids at Giza. And as a young engineer, I was so stunned, overawed by the enormous construction and thought to myself, how could they have done this almost 5,000 years ago? I couldn't think of doing it today. That was my first introduction and it stayed with me. And I got quite ill after a year and had to return to the United States. Because of my illness, I got out of the Navy completely and I went to work in the construction business in New York. But I still kept, my heart was still in Cairo, at Giza. So after a few years as an engineer here in the city, I decided, I don't think I'm ever going to make any money at this. The civil engineers were not well paid. So I started my own business. And it became wildly successful. And within a very short time, um, I was very comfortable, and I started collecting Egyptian art. And in those days, you, there were plenty of dealers, there was plenty of material, and it was cheap. So I started gathering things. And then I realized, you know, I'm being rather stupid. I'm spending this money and all of this interest, and I don't know anything about this stuff. What's good, what's bad, what's fake, what isn't? So I decided I'd better learn. After I sold the business to RCA uh, in 1970, I had a mandatory five-year contract to deal with, which I did. And afterward, I went back to school. Um, I had known Bernard Bothmer, and he was then an adjunct professor at the Institute of Fine Arts right up across the street, literally. And I think we both took a shine to each other. I mean, I was quite different than what he normally had as a student, no background whatsoever. But I was willing to learn, and he was very anxious to teach. And he, I think he saw in me what he later described to my embarrassment as his successor as an art historian. That was going a little far, but it was very flattering. And uh, I stayed with Renard for quite a few years. I also learned a lot from some of my fellow students, like Ann Rustman, who was a phenomenal art historian. And she also liked me and guided me through a lot of material that uh, Bernard didn't. And as time went on, I thought, well, I've had this education, now what do I do with it other than buy antique antiquities? So I started to write. 
And I wrote about a small piece I had from the 26th dynasty. And I realized by looking at it, it was something very strange about it. It was altered from royal to private, a very unusual thing. And I, you could see where the uh, Uraeus had been obliterated, and I published it in the JEA. That was in 1988. And I liked doing that, and I got some fairly nice notice about it, and I kept writing, always about the late period, because that was Bernard's passion. And uh, I spent a lot of time with the, uh, the great archive that he had built over the years. He and Mueller and de Molinar particularly, uh, all of them very, very fine art historians and Egyptologists. And I felt very comfortable doing that. But as time went on, I met another gentleman, Gunter Dreyer, who was then deputy head of the DAIK. And we got to be very fast friends. And I visited Abydos many times at his excavations at the tombs of the archaic kings, and even the god of two kings uh, were there. And we started to talk and argue about things. And he said, let's collaborate. So I started collaborating with Gunter. We've written, I think, five articles together. Uh, some of them have really uh, gotten a lot of critical acclaim, mostly due to Gunter, who is, uh, in my mind, the master of that period, and the first one to be able to read the very early hieroglyphs and my thing was the interpretation of symbolic writing before the um, hieroglyphs became common, and that was its own language. And between the two of us, we, as I say, we got very involved in the history of the time. I mean, very few people knew anything whatsoever about it about the first and second dynasty and even dynasty zero kings and we've we've gotten immersed in that and i guess as long as we're both around we'll stay immersed in it and i think it's one of the most interesting periods of egyptian history certainly the least known with the there are monuments but not the kind of monuments you see in the middle and uh, new kingdoms so i'm very happy with that in the late 70s. Um, at that time, um, Bernard was in charge more or less. I say more or less because Hansen was also very involved. He was then Dean of Students at the Institute of Fine Arts. And um, it was a, a massive undertaking. Uh, of course, I was able to help because I had a background in civil engineering which included surveying. So I surveyed that whole plateau where the late period ruins were, and of course recognized very well that this mound was not just a late period, it went back at least as far as the old kingdom. And I was very excited about that, and I enjoyed it very much. Uh, after two years, um, as you know, Hansen was a Middle Eastern uh, excavator and uh, historian. He saw a mud brick roof. Ah, he says, this is where I want to be, because he was familiar with mud brick, that being the, uh, used all over Mesopotamia. And we dug into it, uncovered it, and found, to our dismay, that it was basically a junk pile. And after spending a whole season in it, 
There were fragments in there, but they were not in any order. It was just a place where they threw refuse, basically, and then roofed it over. And I said to Bernard, this is not what I think we should be doing. He said, I agree. He said, you talk the handsome. <laughs> I said, okay. So I got hold of Donald and uh, we had dinner one night in Cairo, Bernard, Hanson, myself, and I said, um, Donald, I don't think, I think we're wasting our time in that part of the dig. There's so many other things here. He said, what do you mean? He said, uh, don't you know about stratification? I said, I do. I said, I'm a civil engineer and I studied soil mechanics and I do know about it. I said, would you mind telling me what strata there are in a junk heap? And he looked shocked. And I said, well, I was at that point financing it. I said, I'm not going to finance this anymore. Oh, he says, I'm very disappointed. I said, I am too. But I hope we can remain friends, which we sort of did. Bernard was delighted, not with ceasing, but having me talk back to Hanson and tell him that he can't pull the wool over my eyes, which he was trying to do. <laughs> so that was uh, the end of that one. And um, I'm the only other time I've really been in an excavation is with Gunter at Abydos, particularly at the tomb of Kasakawi, which is a monumental tomb. And now completely uh, um, excavated and closed up because the Germans are no longer working at Abydos to everybody's chagrin, I'm afraid. But the new uh, director was not interested and has directed all of their efforts to other areas of Egypt, which is uh, it's very sad because they had uh, um, one of the most important um, areas in all of Egypt, in my mind. It told us a great deal about how the empire arose and nobody's ever talked about that really. So that's what we did and uh, I enjoyed that very much and uh, the the German excavation house there was very comfortable with a very good cook <laughs> so it was okay. But I've had limited, let's say very limited uh, experience in excavating and I never felt qualified to actually run an excavation because I simply did not have the background for it. Uh, in 1990, I became the chairman of the Cultural Property Advisory Committee, which uh, is based on a law that was um, um, done by Senator Moynihan, who I greatly admired in order to try to protect the monuments in um, countries like Egypt that were being raped, literally, by um, smugglers and uh, people who were acting as in-betweeners and dealers. And I, I found that I was able to accomplish a few things in it. Uh, we did pass some treaties. But strangely enough, I went to Egypt to meet with the Minister of Culture at that time, Farouk Hosni. And I explained to him what this law was. It would ban the importation of any ancient Egyptian material into the United States without their permission. Oh, he said, that sounds wonderful. The monuments themselves were not injured but the artifacts were. And, and I saw many, many cases, and the Egyptians just shrugged it off. Places like Peru, Cambodia, all signed treaties with us. And it helped. It didn't stop it. Nothing will. Uh, when there's money, there's no solution to its problems. 
So I served for five years, first under the first President Bush, George H.W. Bush, and then under Clinton. But I was very um, uh, enamored with the first President Bush. I'm a very liberal Democrat, I promise you. And I've never voted for a Republican in my life except for him on his second term. But he was a very uh, erudite man. He didn't have the personality that some have, but he was very solid. And he only lost because there was a um, recession right at the time of the election. But Clinton was not at all interested. But one of the rewards that uh, President Bush had given me was a reappointment a few days before he left office. <laughs> so Clinton was stuck with me for a while, but it was okay, and everything continued. But it, it has a place in our society, but there are so many influences against it. I mean, when you talk about the destruction of monuments, you really should be talking about war or rebellion. I mean, if you look at uh, what happened during the so-called Egyptian Revolution, where they burned at least one museum and stole a lot of stuff from Saqqara, from the warehouse, and Serbia, uh, just dreadful. And, you know, we're Egyptologists because we value these ancient people and their culture and their civilization. And these things all tend to destroy it. I mean, what ISIS has done, particularly on Palmyra, where I spent a lot of time. And in fact, I knew the gentleman who was the uh, archaeologist in charge, who was beheaded because he refused to tell ISIS where he had hidden the artifacts from the small museum they had there. It was dreadful. And of course now Syria, I think the only thing that's really intact now is uh, uh, some sites, uh, San Simeon, which is uh, um, a very early group of structures, but it's in the part that is in, not contested, it's in the part of Syria where uh, Assad is lived lives. So that was my story with, uh, we called it CPAC. Well, I fired the International Federation of Art, Federation for Art Research, and it was created, I believe, in 1969 by uh, the then uh, Attorney General of the State of New York because there was a lot of forgery, mostly in paintings and drawings, of course, lots of forgeries, and they wanted an independent group to be able to rule on those, because there were lawsuit after lawsuit, and of course, judges and juries have no clue as to what art historians might be talking about. So they, uh, they formed this cultural, uh, the IFAR, and IFAR, was in existence, I guess, about 20 years, and Bernard Bothmer was on its board. So Bernard, of course, blackjacked me into becoming a member of the board, and eventually I became the chairman, and was the chairman for 17 years. We did a lot for, not just in terms of forgery, but in terms of law regarding, uh, we had a lot of influence in the decisions uh, about uh, stolen uh, art by the Nazis during the Second War, preserving the rights of the survivors past the statute of limitations. So we did a lot, and of course, it's, I uh, retired from it a couple of years ago, and I just didn't feel I had the energy uh, to do this. But they are very much in business. They have some marvelous websites, catalog raisonnés, uh, lots of things where people can get a solid background 
on objects they might be contemplating buying or selling. So it's a great organization. RC, I first joined in the mid-1980s. I became a board member in, I think, 1988 and was for close to, must be 15 years or more. Um, because I had been a businessman, they immediately put me on the finance committee. And I can tell you that I did the biggest favor for RC ever because they had a lot of funds that came um, from the government. They were safely tucked away in a very high interest account in Cairo. And my brother-in-law, Magda's brother, a very smart man, said to me one day, you know what, there's going to be a major devaluation of the pound, the Egyptian pound. I said, really? He said, absolutely. He said, you can count on it. Well, I immediately went to the other two members of the Finance Committee and said, I have good information that there's going to be a devaluation. Let us get our money out now. And we did. We transferred virtually all of it into dollars. About a week after that, the value of the pound dropped by a half. So the 20 million became 10 million. But in our case, it stayed 20 million. And I will always be very thankful to uh, name is Tariq Salah uh, for his very good tip. I understand the pressing need for money to do these things, particularly restoration. Very expensive. And I hope that continues, and I hope they continue to use the money wisely. Yeah, Brooklyn was my first love, first because of the Wilbur Library, which has no equal, I don't think, in the United States. Um, and of course, Bothmer was um, the curator in charge. So I would be out there all the time. Um, I mean, I admired their collection. I admired Bothmer. And at that time, Richard Vizzini and Jim Romano and Bob Bianchi were all there. And that was quite a crew. Um, Jim Romano, who died very tragically, was in my mind one of the very best art historians of them all. He had a very keen mind and a very good eye, and I very much admired him and Richard. Uh, Bob, of course, got himself into a little bit of problem with the museum and left um, a fairly long time ago. But it was a very great pleasure to be with these people, um, particularly uh, those four that I mentioned, and I enjoyed it very much. The When I first came on the scene, so to speak, uh, Henry Fisher was in charge at the Met, and he was a very nice man and a brilliant scholar, but he was not very ebullient. He wasn't an outgoing person, um, a very fine uh, scholar of language, and he had a very great interest, obviously, in objects. And then, of course, when he left, uh, Christine Lilliquist, who also did a very fine job and oversaw the reconstruction, basically, of the department and its holdings, and I don't think she's ever gotten as much credit as she deserved. And she's a pretty good scholar as well. And I think she's still working. So I have, I have a high regard for those people. And of course, Ann Russman, who I was quite close to, also was there. Marsha Hill, very fine uh, group. And 
it, basically they've done a very good job uh, showing, you know, mounting the collection, lighting it. Of course, that's the museum, but um, it's, in my mind, about the best exhibit I've ever seen of Egyptian art and statuary particularly. So I have very strong feelings for both institutions. I'm very happy they're close to me. And of course, I was a great user of Wilbur in Brooklyn. Uh, at that time, the library was very open. Today, it's rather closed down. Not closed down, but access is very limited, which is too bad. And of course, they've got the great archive of both are there. And that is um, seldom used, I'm sorry to say. And it's a more remarkable group of documents and photographs. Because one of the things that Bernard taught all of us was how to photograph an object with his raking light. And he, he made all of us go through this business of holding the lights for him because he wanted us to understand what it was all about. And I, I, I appreciated that. And all of his students, I, I think, did also. And Bernard was a, a, a very, uh, what's the word, obstinate soul. And we used to, like I do with Gunter, we used to argue a lot. And um, I think we both learned from it. And I was most appreciative. As we all know, the Egyptian Museum in Cairo is the largest and most complete collection of Egyptian artifacts in the world. It's been there, I guess, since about 1898 or 1902, maybe. Um, unfortunately, they've always suffered from a lack of funds. And I remember when I first went there with Mohammed Saleh, he would be paying for the soap and the cleaning materials out of his own pocket. And the same thing happened with Mamduk el Damati when he became the director. Um, it was producing a huge amount of money for the Antiquities Authority, I mean the admissions. But they took it and used it for other purposes and gave very little of it back to the museum. I mean, in the, since I've been going there, which goes back a long way, I don't think they've acquired a single object other than excavated material that were given to them. But acquisition-wise, no. And still, there is nothing like it. And if you've ever been in the storage area in the basement, you can appreciate there is stuff there that's been packed for 70 or 100 years. It's never been opened. They don't know what they've got there. And as at one point, uh, they opened some of these boxes and found Tutankhamun's, um, all of his clothing. By that time, in that damp basement, it had literally disintegrated to dust. So much of it was lost. And I believe the Dutch have been working to try and salvage as much as they could. But the museum itself, it has some very good people running it, and mostly Mohammed Saleh and Mamdou El Damati. I don't know the present uh, man, but I'm sure he's doing his best. Now that the new museum is going to be online within another couple of years, I don't know what's going to happen to it, whether they're just going to move everything out or uh, keep two museums. Of course, there's more than two museums of Egyptian art and uh, Egyptian artifacts in Cairo. But I, I was very, uh, very pleased to, whenever I went in there, I was always made most welcome, allowed access to almost anything I wanted. And when Mohammed was still the, um, director of the museum, 
he approached me and Mamdulka de Marti to do a catalogue general of the late period um, statuary. Well, I, of course, I was very flattered to say the least, and that was the first time I'd met Mamdulka, who, as you know, be eventually became minister. Spectacular man, straight as an arrow, something you don't always find in Egypt, excellent scholar, a really good philologist, but he had a good nose for everything else as well. He came to the United States, I believe it was in 1997 or so, and we spent the whole summer at the Wilbur Library with the archives of Bothmer, and we did uh, I think we did a pretty good job because many people tell me now it's the only catalog general that has information in it, not just the object. So I was very proud of that. And Mohammed was also pleased, Salah, and he said, um, how about doing another one for, we did Dynasties 25 and 26. He said, how about 28 through 30? I said, sure. And Mom Duk said the same. So we had to get written permission from the, um, they have an outside board at the museum. They, were, they refused to allow me to be part of it because I was a foreigner and they don't need foreigners. The xenophobia, of course. They don't need foreigners. Let Mom Duk do it. Now Mom Duk, being a gentleman and a scholar, said, absolutely not. If I can't work with Jack, I'm not working. So we, we passed it up. Now that, that was when, um, and I forget the name of that committee, but it's the supervisory committee of the museum. And it was just pure xenophobia, which I'm afraid is going to happen more often in Egypt. You know, where there are some very good Egyptian archaeologists, Egyptologists, and they're capable of some very good work, but they don't have the money. And how else can I put it? Um, the experience, literally. Uh, when I look at people like Dieter Arnold and Dreyer and many others, they've worked their whole lifetime at these excavations. They publish, they've done everything right. And I, you know, very much admire all of those people and others. And I'll be very sorry if Egypt clamps down on foreign excavators, which I'm afraid is going to happen. But that's all we can say is uh, too bad. Well, there are many Egyptologists that I have, uh, I hold in great esteem and respect. In fact, it's difficult for me to talk about any that I don't respect because I respect most of them. But I'm one of the ones who shine in my light, or my shining lights. Betsy Bryan, I think, is super. And she's done a marvelous job, not only in her excavations and in her research, but as a teacher. And I can't hold anybody in higher esteem than that because she's turned out some awfully good Egyptologists and continues to do so. Kara Cooney and JJ and the others, that's wonderful. Um, I was very friendly with Harry James, who I also greatly admired, and we had a very nice relationship because one thing Harry liked was fine wine. And he used to say, you know, um, he was on the board of the Freud, Sigmund Freud Foundation for many years, and they would hold the meeting once a year in New York. He said, I only come to that meeting because of you and your wine. <laughs>
especially my wine. So when Harry came, every night we would open a very good bottle of wine. <laughs> but Harry was also a very good uh, Egyptologist, one of the very best. And his writings are splendid. And he's like Cyril Aldred, uh, knows how to write English. I mean, I'm very jealous about that because I'm not in their league, but um, I admire their writing very much and what they say. Uh, Cyril Aldred I, I found to be um, the most articulate and well-reasoning art historian. And when I think today it is not art history, Egyptian art history is not merely being taught anymore. I get a creepy feeling because I look at his work, Bernard Bothmer's work, Von Bissing, Mueller, all of these great ones, Borcher. They, they really built the, the, what we call the science of Egyptology. They've been a very dramatic part of it. And um, if it's not going to be taught anymore, I'm afraid that uh, things will go downhill uh, as far as Egyptology is concerned. Looking at a lot of objects, how this is stored in your mind, and when you see another one, you say, oh, I recognize that. Well, that's going to disappear, I'm afraid. And the other thing about art history, forgive me for <laughs> talking this way, but it's very important to me. When I first started working with Gunter Dreyer, on this very early Magadha 2D particularly, uh, he pointed out to me the first use of hieroglyphs right at the end of Magadha 2D. And I said, but what about these ceremonial knife handles? They have their language too, don't they? And he said, what do you mean? I said, they tell a story the same way writing does. You know, the elephants trampling the snakes. This is writing of a different kind. It's figurative writing. And it's interpretive. And he said, I buy that. <laughs> Which, coming from Gunther, was a great compliment. I, I met Magda in 1978. My first wife had, uh, was still alive at that time, and I met her at the Brooklyn Museum in Bernard Bothmer's office, because Magda was doing her dissertation at NYU and wanted to know more about early Egyptian dance. She was with her mother. She was then in her early 30s. And it was a very cold, wet day in November. I had driven out, and I asked these two ladies where they were staying. And they were staying one block from where I lived. I said, good, I'll be happy to drive you back. And they were both very, very grateful. And I came home to my wife and I said, I met, just met these two ladies from Egypt. Very interesting, very nice. Let's have them for dinner. And we did, about a week later. And that was the last I saw of Magda for 13 years. Um, in the interim, my first wife passed away. Uh, that was in 1987. And uh, I was sent by the Secretary of State to Egypt to discuss what I spoke about earlier with the Minister of Culture, the Cultural Property Committee. And I arrived in Cairo early in the afternoon after a sleepless flight, and the people from the embassy met me and said, do you want to go to sleep now, or would you rather stay up to get back on time? Because if you want to stay up, there's an outdoor party in Cairo that you would be invited to. And I said, yes, I think so. And they had a musical entertainment. In fact, it was, uh, if I recall, it was an RC affair. 
the head of musical entertainment, and who was the presenter? Magda. So I went up to her afterward, and I said, uh, I don't know whether you remember me, but we met many years ago in New York. And I said, oh yes, of course I remember you, which was a lie. She didn't remember me from a hole in the wall. And I said, um, I'm going to be in Cairo for a week. Perhaps we can have dinner one evening. She said, absolutely, that would be lovely. I don't have my agenda with me. I'll call you. Where are you staying? I told her. And she did call a year later. She was in Washington looking for a job because she was sick and tired of Egypt. And I had given her my card, and on it was a big gold eagle. You know, very important looking card. So she thought she'd call me looking for a job. And I gave her one. Here. <laughs> that was a year later. Uh, but Magda, as you know, was the prima ballerina of Egypt in the 60s and in the 80s became the founding director of the New Cairo Opera. And she was too good at what she was doing, and she made the minister at that time jealous, so he booted her. And that's why she came to the States. It was a very tough time for her. But she has a very keen interest in Egyptology. She's very good at the English language, so she helps edit my articles and things, and uh, as I say, very interested, uh, likes to talk about um, Egypt, I mean ancient Egypt, and modern Egypt too. And so it's, it's been quite a, uh, a good tie-up. All I can say is I am hopeful for the future of Egypt, of Egyptology. I'm always very happy to meet young people who are interested in Egyptology. Of course, I warn them there aren't many jobs in this field, so be careful. <laughs> but I think that for historians, looking back, thousands of years, there are lessons to be learned for now. We don't listen to them, but they're there. <laughs>